Hello and welcome to Intermediate Financial Accounting 2 Tutorial 9A Alternative. This tutorial will provide an alternative approach to calculating deferred or future income taxes using a T-account approach. We will begin our alternative approach to deferred future income tax first using property, plant and equipment for the Prometheus example for the year 2020. What we're going to do is reconstruct the appropriate T accounts. So the first account we want to reconstruct is the undepreciated capital cost or the tax basis account. This account represents what you would actually see on a tax return. When you record assets, they go into a CCA pool, capital cost allowance, they go into a pool and additions are tracked as well as disposals and CCA calculations. Basically, the government and your tax return tracks any undepreciated or any amounts for which capital cost allowance has not yet been taken. We start with the beginning balance as provided of $411,840. There's an addition during 2020 of $110,000. We're also told that during the year there's a disposal. But what happens is, for tax purposes, the amount that gets taken out of the disposal is the lower of original cost or proceeds. Now it's very rare that an asset will actually go up in value. So usually what happens is an asset is purchased for a certain amount and then over time it loses its value. So in this case, the amount of the proceeds that was obtained for the asset that was sold was $15,000. Then we deduct CCA. In this particular situation it's given, sometimes you might have to calculate it. So we deduct $41,910, giving us an ending balance of UCC at the end of 2020 of $464,930. Next, we will construct the balance sheet balance or carrying value, also known as net book value. So CV's carrying value or net book value. And this is what we would actually find on the company's balance sheet. At the beginning of 2020, we had 418,000. The company purchased 110,000 in assets, so we put that as an addition, and notice that the addition is the same on both the UCC calculation and the carrying value. Except, in this case, the disposal, for accounting purposes, comes out at its net book value, or its carrying value, which of course is your original cost minus accumulated depreciation. We're told that the net book value on the asset disposed is $8,000. So we take that off of our balance sheet. We would actually do that in a journal entry where we would credit the original cost for whatever the cost was and then debit accumulated depreciation. But what you end up with is a net book value. So we're taking a very abbreviated approach to our T account here, showing one account for the net book value of an asset, which includes accumulated depreciation. Then during the year, we're also given what the depreciation expense is. So we would deduct that. And we take our beginning balance plus our additions minus the disposal and minus the 35,000 in depreciation expense. We end up with an ending 2020 balance on the balance sheet of $485,000. Now is where we would go about calculating or creating a T account for the deferred or future income tax for property, plant and equipment. This would also appear on the company's balance sheet. What we do is figure out the beginning balance. Now the beginning balance is determined by taking the difference between the beginning balances in your UCC account and the carrying value account or what you would see on the balance sheet. The beginning balance of $411,840 less the $418,000 carrying value multiplied by the enacted tax rate of 40%. This was the tax rate that was applicable to future taxes in 2019. This results in a negative balance in the calculation. And I need to iterate, it's very important that you do this this way. The tax amount minus the book value amount. If you do it backwards, you'll have the incorrect balance for the deferred tax. 411,840 is less than 418,000. This gives us a negative balance, but this translates into a credit balance, which means now we have a deferred tax liability. So I'm putting in the T account a beginning balance of 2,464 beginning deferred or future tax liability. Then I calculate the ending balance the same way I calculated the beginning balance. 
I take 464,930 ending UCC minus $485,000 ending carrying value or net book value times the enacted tax rate, this time of 35%, gives me an ending deferred tax balance of 7,025. Again, still a credit. So what this tells me is that the end of 2017, I have a net future tax liability. And this should make sense because if your UCC balance is lower than the carrying value, it means you have claimed depreciation for tax purposes faster than you have claimed it on the income statement. Now that we know that we have an ending balance of 7,025, we had a beginning balance of 2,464, our adjustment that's necessary to make this work is going to be a plug of $4,561. Now that I have reconstructed my T accounts for UCC and carrying value and determined what the ending balance in the deferred tax account is and have also determined what I need to adjust that account, I can now create a journal entry. In order to record the adjustment to go from beginning deferred tax liability balance of 2464 to an ending balance of 7025, I need a credit to my deferred tax account of $4,561. And therefore, I need to debit my deferred income tax expense account or recovery. So I've created a new T account right here that's deferred income tax expense recovery. And that 4561 is debited to that account. Now remember that expense accounts are closed out every year, so there is no beginning balance. So our first item into the deferred income tax expense recovery account is 4,561. The next item we're going to calculate deferred future tax for is the warranty. Now here's something that's new. We will still start with a tax basis amount. However, the tax basis for warranties, the way I approach it, is always zero because there is no remaining undeducted tax balance. The only amount that is deductible for income tax purposes or actual warranty costs incurred. And there's no place on the tax return to keep track of unexpensed amounts because unexpensed amounts don't exist. You either have warranty costs that are deductible or they aren't. And so the company will always deduct all of its actual warranty costs, leaving no undeducted amount going forward. So once we know the tax basis is always zero, we will then reconstruct the warranty liability on the balance sheet. Just like we did with property, plant, and equipment, we reconstructed the asset balance on the balance sheet. Well, the warranty liability is the item that you'll see on the balance sheet as well. So we'll reconstruct the warranty liability starting with the beginning balance of $20,000. Then, during the year, the company had an estimated expense of $51,000. You should recall the entry to record warranty would be a debit to warranty expense and a credit to warranty liability. So we have a credit to warranty liability for the expense, and then we take out actual costs incurred from the warranty liability account. So we would credit cash and debit the warranty liability for $47,000. We end up with an ending balance at the end of 2020 on the balance sheet, a warranty liability account of $24,000. The next step is to determine the ending deferred tax or future income tax balance in the deferred tax account related to warranty. As we did with the PPE, we determined the beginning balance first in the deferred income tax, future income tax warranty account as being the tax basis minus the accounting basis. But in this case, we know that the tax basis is always zero. So we take zero tax basis minus the $20,000 credit balance. And so we're subtracting a negative number here. And remember, with your basic math, when you take something minus a negative, it turns into a positive. So when we take a zero minus a negative 20, that's the same thing as adding 20,000. We multiply by the enacted tax rate of 40%. This gives us a beginning deferred tax asset account of $8,000. This is a deferred tax asset now. So the deferred tax account for warranty has a debit balance, a beginning balance of $8,000. We then proceed to determine the ending balance. Again, we'll take zero tax basis minus the $24,000 credit balance on the balance sheet. This time the enacted tax rate is 35%. This results in an ending deferred tax asset of $8,400. Then, what this means, if we need to go from a debit balance of $8,000 to a debit balance of $8,400, we need a $400 plug, and that will be the basis for our journal entry.
Now that we know that the ending balance in our deferred income tax account for warranty needs to be 8400 and the beginning was 8000 we need a debit to that account of $400. This turns into a journal entry where we will debit the deferred income tax or future tax warranty account for $400 and I will credit my deferred income tax expense or recovery account. So now we'll go to the next item in our temporary differences, which was the patent development costs. Now, this isn't the capitalization of a patent. These are specific development costs, which are treated differently. Tax basis is where we start. Now, in this case, it's always zero because, as identified in the data, the development costs were deductible for income tax purposes. So they were fully deducted, which means there is no remaining undeducted amount for tax purposes to carry forward. So the balance is always zero. We then have an account on our balance sheet that we would put these development costs into. This happened new this year, so there is no beginning balance. Beginning balance is zero, and we add these development costs of 100000 which gives us an ending balance of 100000 and then we'll calculate the balance in the deferred or future tax account for the patent development costs. Now, since the beginning balances, of course, are all zero, the zero tax basis, minus the zero beginning accounting balance times enacted tax rate of 40% gives us a beginning balance of zero. And then I can calculate the ending balance, being again zero tax basis, minus the $100,000 ending debit balance times the 35% tax rate, will give us a negative amount, right? So that's a credit balance of 35,000, and that's a deferred tax liability. The beginning balance is zero, the ending balance is 35,000. This means I need a plug or an adjustment or a credit to my deferred to future tax account for patent costs of $35,000. And that's shown in the journal entry. I'm going to credit the deferred to future tax patent development cost account for 35,000 which means I need a debit to my deferred income tax or future tax expense. So the $35,000 gets debited to the DIT, or future income tax expense or recovery account. Now the next and the last item that represents a temporary difference that we need to calculate deferred tax balances for is the bond discount. So we have a bond that was issued during the year, and it was issued at a discount. The tax basis, the way we'll do it, will always be zero. The only amount that's deductible for tax purposes are the actual interest costs or interest expenses that are paid to the bondholders, the cash amount that's paid, not the expense calculated for accounting purposes using the effective rate. So there's no undeducted interest payments carried forward on the income tax return. But we do have on the balance sheet an account for the discount on the bond. How do we know this? Well. This piece is a little bit complicated, but acts as a, as a good review of present value. And I'm going to show you two ways to determine the amount of the bond discount amortization. We know that the bond was issued at a discount because the effective rate or the face rate was 5.5% and the yield to maturity is 6.5%. So because 5.5 is lower, we know that this is a discount. And we can determine what the amount of the discount is by taking 10 periods, 5.5 interest rate, $55,000 payment, which is 5.5% on 1 million, and a million dollar future value. That will give us a negative amount of $923,000 or something. And then, of course, but the way the calculator works is if you put these numbers in the payment and the future value as positive numbers, it will produce a negative PV. So adding a million dollars means that we have a balance on the discount of 71,888. The balance of the bond payable, if you use the net basis, you'd have a bond payable account of 928,911. Well, this is the same thing as a bond payable balance of 1 million offset with a discount of 71,888. The rest is pretty easy because then, of course, with each payment, the discount is amortized. So if we just go and take our calculator and put 9N, nine, 9 payments remaining, that will give us a different ending balance in the account. If we did it this way, it would be 933,438, which means the difference between these two is the amortization of the bond, which is 5,327. 
Or what we have here, if we take 933,438, which is what the present value is here, add a million dollars, we end up with a balance of 66,561. The difference between the ending balance and the bond discount and the beginning is a credit of 5,327. So you could calculate it using the bond discount values or calculate it using the total net value in the bond. I'm doing it this way to show that what we're doing is amortizing the actual discount of the bond. There is another calculation, but you have to be careful if you're going to use it because it's based on cumulative amounts. This is the first year the bond was issued. So the amounts this year are also the cumulative amounts. So the interest that was paid is $55,000. The interest expense calculated using the effective rate is $60,327. Now these numbers are given in the data, so you don't have to calculate them. Taking 55 minus 60,327 is a negative 5327, which supports the calculation here of 5327. And so this is the accumulated discount amortization. If you were to go forward the next year, you could continue to determine the cumulative amount of the, the discount amortized by having two years or two payments of 55 would be 110 minus whatever the accumulated effective accounting rate interest is. So now that we have determined what the beginning and ending balances are here, we want to figure out what the ending balance in the deferred or future tax account for bond amortization is. This is the first year of the bond, so there's no opening accumulated amortization of the bond discount, so the beginning balance is zero. We calculate the ending balance as a tax basis of zero, right? Again, it's always zero because, I'll say it again, once the company deducts the actual payment paid to the bondholders, there is no undeductible amount, so the tax basis is always zero. But be very careful here and see where I'm putting my box. I'm not putting a box around the ending balance of the bond discount account. I'm taking the tax basis minus the accumulated discount amortized, which is 5327. So it's not the ending balance, it's actually the cumulative amount, okay? This is the rare situation where we're not using the beginning and ending balance to calculate the ending balance in the deferred tax account. So once we know that we're doing this properly, we take, and of course, you see this is a credit, so zero minus a negative 5327, times the enacted tax rate applicable to future taxes of 35% gives you a debit because zero minus a negative is a positive. So we have a debit, which is now a deferred tax asset of 1,865. From a beginning balance of zero means we need a plug of 1,865, which translate into a journal entry, a debit to the deferred or future tax account for the bond discount, and a credit to the expense account. And those are the four items. The final balance in the deferred income tax expense account is 37,296. 4,561 from property, plant, and equipment, a $400 credit for the warranty, 35,000 from the patent development costs, and a credit of 1865 for the bond discount amortization. So what we'll see on the income statement is deferred or future tax expense of 37,296, which is what we saw when we did it the other method. This last slide is just a summary of everything that we did. It looks a little overwhelming, but once you get into the groove, I find that the T account approach is A, more efficient and B, easier to understand because you end up having to recreate these accounts anyway, even if you're using the table approach. I've got separate accounts for each of the temporary differences, but only one account here for the deferred or future income tax expense recovery account. So with the PPE, that was this first item up here, property, plant, and equipment, we reconstructed the UCC account, we reconstructed the balance sheet account, and took the difference. We have a deferred income tax liability of 7025 and we had an expense of that associated uh, 4561 The warranty, tax base is zero, minus the ending balance of 24,000, gave us an ending balance of 8,400. It's a debit balance, which means we have a future benefit by being able to deduct these amounts when we actually incur the cost. A debit to that account resulted in a credit to the deferred tax expense. The development costs, the balance of zero, zero minus $100,000 debit gives us a $35,000 ending balance credit. So we credited that account and then we debited the income tax expense account. 
And then for the bond discount, again, tax base is always zero. We had 53.27 being the amount of the cumulative bond discount amortization times the 35% tax rate, give us an ending balance of 18.65 debit. And then we plug that account with a credit as well to the deferred income tax expense recovery. So it's up to you to select the approach that you like. Some people prefer the table. But again, because you end up having to calculate the beginning and ending UCC and carrying value amounts and the warranty liability and development costs, that work you have to do anyway. So rather than do a T account and put it into a table, if you start to see how you progress and how each of the accounts enables you to determine the deferred income tax account for each of the temporary differences, then it's a lot easier. And then have just one account for the deferred income tax expense or recovery account. So we hope that you found this particularly useful as an alternative approach to take to calculating deferred income tax.